On August 15, 2018, Chris Watts underwent his final infamous interrogation that would result in a horrifying confession that would leave the community and law enforcement heartbroken in stunned disbelief. But at that same moment in time, just a few miles away, the FBI was meeting with his mistress, Nicole Kessinger. And from the moment their interview began, she appeared to conduct a concerted effort to mislead, misdirect, and outright lie at virtually every step of her involvement. In today's video, I will show you the additional evidence that I have compiled using only law enforcement's discovery records to demonstrate how Nicole Kessinger continued to deceive law enforcement throughout the remaining interviews they conducted. Additionally, I will discuss the shocking details that Nicole accidentally revealed in her final interview with CBI agent Kevin Kobach, as well as the perplexing issue of why her father was allowed by law enforcement to be present during her interviews. But this Don't lead. Hypothetically. Please. Don't hypothetically. lead Hypothetically. If she, okay. you understand where I'm going. If right, you didn't you're, know, you're leading into right. questions that are but, nothing with your. If you didn't know, though. Wait, Nick. And before this video is over, I will share with you what I believe can still be done to encourage law enforcement to reopen the investigation into Chris Watts' former mistress. And on the five-year anniversary of this horrific tragedy, I would like to show you the additional facts that I have found hiding in plain sight that tell a compelling and undeniable tale. And to demonstrate to you the overwhelming evidence that has left me certain that justice is still within reach. This is The Black Widow's Tale, The Chris Watts Case, Episode 3. When we last met, we had made our way through Nicole Kessinger's first interview with law enforcement that was conducted on the evening of August 15, 2018. But after the news broke of Chris's confession throughout the inner workings of law enforcement's leadership, it became evident that they would need to interview Nicole again and without delay. A short time after Chris's confession, law enforcement's command would assign Colorado Bureau of Investigation agent Kevin Kobach to the responsibility of communicating with and interviewing Nicole Kessinger. Agent Kobach would reach out to their now protected witness and set the first of several interviews that would commence on the afternoon of August 16, 2018. And from the very beginning of this interview, it was obvious to me that Nicole Kessinger's primary objective was to protect herself while simultaneously dissuading law enforcement from obtaining the objective truth no matter what the cost or what she had to do to accomplish it. Due to the nature and history of this case, I want to remind everyone of a few important but short disclaimers before we begin. Number one, victim blaming will not be tolerated on this channel, period. No victim or their families deserves to be denigrated, maligned, or disparaged regardless of the reason. This is a core value of this channel and is not something that I will debate now or ever. Number two, the aim of this series is to provide each of you the evidence as shown by law enforcement's discovery records and the interviews they release to the public. I do not platform unfounded conspiracy theories on this channel. My opinions are my own and are only based upon the available evidence. And as always, after providing my own personal insights, I will always encourage everyone to arrive at your own conclusions. And three, every case that I discuss involve real people with families who have been devastated by these crimes. Therefore, no form of harassment, negative commentary, or brigading of any person involved in this case will be tolerated on this channel. Justice the truth, and advocacy for the victims is our guiding light, and it always will be. Nicole Kessinger arrived for her second interview with agents Kevin Kobach and Tim Martinez on the afternoon of August the 16th, 2018, just three days after the tragic events of this horrific crime. 
The interview would be predominantly led by Agent Kobach and was conducted at the Thornton Police Department with Nicole's father, Dwayne Kessinger, attentively at her side. And just like the day prior with the FBI, Nicole would waste no time in making her first of a series of complete fabrications within the first three minutes of this interview. I think I met him sometime in June, probably early June. It might have been May. It was just talking at work. It was pretty casual. Um, and uh, he didn't have a wedding ring on his finger. And every time I talked to him, he didn't tell me that he was in a relationship. He didn't even mention his kids right away either. Okay, so to recap, Nicole just said that she didn't know that Chris was married or that he had kids. And exactly one minute later, she says this. And then he told me that those two were in the process of a separation. Did he mention the children's name or his significant other's name? Um, I didn't know his significant other's name for a while. I want you to remember what Nicole Kessinger just said. Because we just heard her tell Agent Kovac that she didn't know Shanann's name for a while. And we already know from the previous interview that both Nicole and Chris claim that they met sometime the first week of June 2018. But as usual, nothing about what Nicole Kessinger just said is even remotely true. Because almost a year prior to this interview, Nicole Kessinger conducted a very odd Google search that completely contradicts the statements she just made. Because on August 3rd, 2017, she searched for Chris Watts, a man that Nicole claims that she didn't even meet until nearly 10 months later. But what is even more disturbing than that is the fact that Nicole also searched for Shanann Watts on September 1st, 2017, and then again on January 7th, 2018. And the dates of all three searches were confirmed by law enforcement in Detective Pearl's report, and then again by the Weld County District Attorney, who verified that these searches and the dates were correct. And those searches are problematic enough on their own, but during my final day of research, I found something that for me was the final piece of the puzzle that convinced me that law enforcement needs to reopen this investigation. During Nicole's last in-person interview with Agent Kobach, she was in the middle of sulking and complaining when she made a comment that absolutely blew me away. Listen closely. Did you hear that? Because I'll repeat what she just said. Quote, I've only been working for them for like four months. Nicole is talking about how long she worked for Anna Darko, and she said those words on August 23rd, 2018. Which would mean the earliest Nicole Kessinger could have possibly been working at Anna Darko is late March or early April 2018. So then how in the world could Nicole Kessinger be Google searching Chris and Shanann's name nearly eight months before she ever met Chris? Stop for just a moment and really think about that. How could Nicole be searching for Chris and Shanann before she ever started her employment at Anadarko? There is no reasonable explanation for that. And that alone should be all that law enforcement needs to go back and find out whatever it was that Nicole was hiding from them. But you might be surprised to learn that when the Weld County District Attorney Michael Rourke was asked about this very issue, specifically if law enforcement investigated how Nicole could be Google searching Chris and Shanann in 2017, he said this. Quote, we did not get to the point in our investigation of attempting to independently verify that or not because Chris Watts pled guilty. Unquote. That is absolutely absurd. Law enforcement's own discovery report issued and verified by Detective Michael Prill definitively demonstrated that Nicole Kessinger searched for two people that she claims that she didn't even know eight entire months before she ever worked at Anna Darko. And people have the audacity to say that this is a witch hunt? Because there are vital reasons why my choice to outline her deceptions are so incredibly important to this case. 
And simply put, that's because every single time anyone lies to law enforcement, statutorily speaking, that is a crime. You are not allowed to lie to law enforcement for any reason. But even more so when you are the primary witness in their homicide investigation, especially when you will be expected to testify in court concerning the statements you've made. But easily one of the most common rebuttals I routinely hear about Nicole's lies is that maybe she was nervous or embarrassed or maybe she just misspoke. And here's my response to that. Her intent or reasoning for misleading or overtly lying to law enforcement is less than meaningless. Because even if evidence existed that could prove that Nicole was telling all of these lies simply because of embarrassment or innocent self-preservation, that is still not an excuse for breaking the law. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you were pulled over for speeding, going 50 miles over the speed limit in a school zone, and the officer just let you drive away because you told them that you didn't intend to speed. Do you see how absurd that sounds now? Because the fact of the matter is, regardless of Nicole's intent, it does not give her the right to break the law by lying to law enforcement, while at the same time watching law enforcement completely disregard it and then expect the public to simply be okay with that. But do you know what I've noticed and find incredibly revealing about Nicole's deceptions? Her refusal to be honest on so many different occasions tells me that she was far more concerned with preventing law enforcement from finding out whatever it was that she was hiding than the possibility of facing charges for obstruction of justice, destruction of evidence, or even lying to the police. But unfortunately for Nicole, this isn't even close to the only problem with what she said, because on August 30th, 2018, law enforcement spoke with Chris Watt's friend and co-worker, Anthony Brown. Field agent Greg Zentner would interview Anthony Brown to gain a better understanding of his work relationship with Chris. Throughout the conversation, Brown was able to remember with surprising detail and accuracy his prior conversations and interactions with Chris Watts. Brown explained that over the prior six months, they had become fairly close work friends, and Chris had shared a considerable amount of information about his personal life. He recalled specific details about Bella and Cece, their health complications, Shanann's work with Thrive, and even recalled a conversation that they had two months prior about Chris's clear disinterest in his wife's pregnancy. But it was at the end of their conversation that Zentner would learn of something that no one had expected to find. Anthony Brown recalled that Chris Watts was dating a girl named Nikki, who was their co-worker at Anna Darko. And Brown's revelation came before Nicole Kessinger's involvement in the case had ever been made public. Anthony Brown told Agent Zentner about having seen both Nicole and Chris standing extremely and unusually close to each other near the break room. But what was so shocking about his statement was the fact that he recalled seeing this intimate interaction between Chris Watts and Nicole Kessinger sometime in March of 2018. Three entire months before Nicole claimed that she ever met or spoke with Chris Watts. And the problems with Nicole's statements only broaden when you consider the indisputable fact that when she conducted those Google searches for Shanann in September of 2017 and January of 2018, she would have found her very public Facebook account, which did not require an active Facebook account to view. And throughout the entirety of Shanann's Facebook page, she would have seen detailed evidence of her and Chris's marriage, as well as their two beautiful children. But this was just the beginning, and Nicole's inability to tell the truth was only going to get much worse. Did you guys spend most of the time at your place? Always. Okay, always at your place. I told Mark yesterday, he asked me if I went over there, and I told him about one time that I went over to that house. I've been to that house twice, but it was very, very brief, and it was not like an extended stay. I did not feel comfortable there, or like, I just didn't want to be there. Now, this is an issue that we covered in the last episode, specifically how Nicole told FBI agent Mark Lair that she had only ever been to Chris's house once. But then the following day, when Agent Kobach told her that they need her cell phone records, she now magically remembers that she went there twice. But what if I told you that wasn't true either, and I can prove it. During Nicole's fourth interview with law enforcement, 
she again speaks to Agent Kobach telephonically on the 21st of August. The conversation was initiated by Nicole when she texted Agent Kobach to tell him that she had some new information that she wanted to relay. And towards the beginning of their conversation, Agent Kobach will again ask Nicole a very familiar question. Okay, and and you, those are, if I remember right, you only had been there two times, right? Yeah, like I didn't want to go back. After that second time that I was there, I was just like, I don't want to be at this house. Like, if you want to hang out, come to my house. So, so yeah, so the 14th was the last time I was there. Okay. Now, I think we can all agree that Nicole is very plainly telling Agent Kovac that she only ever went to Chris Watts' home twice. In fact, just a few weeks later, on September 4th, 2018, she will again tell law enforcement in her own handwritten account that she was only ever at his house twice. But as usual, Nicole Kessinger lies with such regularity and frequency that she is unable to remember where her lies begin and end. Because just 25 minutes after what we just heard her say, she begins to tell Agent Kobach about her various public outings with Chris. Specifically, their trip on July 21st to Bandemir Speedway. And in the middle of their lighthearted and inappropriately playful discussion about this heinous family annihilator, Nicole accidentally drops a bomb right into the lap of Agent Kobach. Listen closely. You ate lunch there? Yeah, we did. Okay. Tacos. Okay. Um, this is a really good floor, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we, 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 um, we did that, and then we went to Banamir, and then I don't know what we did after Banamir. I think we just went to the house. I'm almost positive. Like, I think we just went to his house. I'm almost positive. Just so we are crystal clear, this would mean that Nicole had been to Chris's house on three different occasions, because this time would have been on the 21st of July, when she previously claimed that she only went there on the 4th and the 14th of July. Now, I'll be completely honest, after having spent over a month listening to Nicole Kessinger's overuse of the word like, and then coupled with these horrifying voicemails. Hi. <laughs> it's me. I miss your face. I was just calling to say hi. Call me back. Bye. Hi. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> I guess just call me back when you have a chance. Bye. I'll admit it. I might be losing my mind. Because maybe I'm crazy, but I'm almost positive that the 21st of July is not the 4th or the 14th of July. So then after hearing her stunning, clearly accidental confession, my next logical question was, well, what did Agent Kobach say to Nicole after she just admitted to having gone to Chris's house a third time? I mean, certainly he would want to ask questions about this new and fundamental change to her entire narrative, right? Well, listen for yourself. I don't know what we did after Bandamere. I think we just went to the house. I'm almost positive. Like, I don't think we did anything after that because it was pretty late. Okay. And then on the weekend of July 28th. Nothing. He says nothing at all. Once again, Nicole Kessinger alters a core element of her prior statements, something she's already done previously with the FBI, and instead of even asking a follow-up question, he just lets her keep talking. And the most disturbing part of that recording is how clear it is that he wasn't even paying attention to any part of her contradictory statements. And we know this because the revelation that Nicole went to Chris's house a third time never makes it into his report. But in this first interview that Agent Kobach had with Nicole Kessinger, we are about to watch the entirety of this interaction go from a simple interview to what is, for me, a complete mockery of the justice system. It just seemed like he had so much going on, and it was just beautiful that I was like, why don't you just try this out, you know, and see if you can fix it. And he'd always be like, well, what about us? What about us? I'm like, don't worry about us. Like, that is more important. Like, try to see if you can, like, salvage whatever it is that you have going on with your wife and, and you know, he, I always got the impression that he was a great father to his kids, like, always. He went to North Carolina, and he was like, I'm going to talk to her when I'm in North Carolina and see if I can get her 
to do this, to, like, try to, like, rekindle the flame. Okay, so try to uh, salvage his relationship as you've been asking him Yes, to do. And, and then if he When decided- did he go to North Carolina? Nicole is explaining to Agent Kovac that at the end of July, she implored Chris to try and fix things with Shanann and rekindle the flame of their marriage. It seems obvious to me that what she was trying to do is establish herself as this neutral third party who was altruistically trying to salvage Chris and Shanann's marriage. And by virtue of Nicole's self-sacrificial actions, it leaves the implication that she couldn't possibly have influenced or encouraged Chris to commit these crimes. And she furthers this claim by saying this. I was just like, why? Fix this. Find a way to fix this. Make it work, you know? And, and I, would, I, would, I was like trying to push him to do it. And he seemed pretty reluctant to do it. He didn't want to. And um, I don't know. We were still seeing each other fairly frequently. But I kind of like backed away so we weren't hanging out quite as much. And we were still close. But it was just... Like, I really wanted him to try. Like, I wanted to know that he tried and it didn't work, and then he moved on. Not that, you know, they both kind of tried, and then he got himself into a situation with somebody else. And I don't know. I just thought he had a beautiful life going on, and he could have made it work. That was the way I looked at it from the outside. Now, if this was my first time ever hearing Nicole make this statement and I knew nothing else about this case or Nicole, I'll be honest, this sounds kind of believable. On the surface, it comes across like someone who realized that she was potentially breaking up a happy family and wanted to try and encourage Chris to do the right thing. But once again, Nicole Kessinger's words and the truth are two entirely different things. Because from the moment Chris left Colorado to join his family in North Carolina at the tail end of July, Nicole would begin an onslaught campaign of sending nude images to Chris repeatedly and on a virtual daily basis. In fact, she continued to text and to call Chris daily regardless of whether or not he was with his family, including an incident that happened when she tried to call him and he didn't answer. So she angrily responded by saying, Why can't you call me? Are you with her? Descending nude images, calling and texting on a daily basis sound like the actions of someone who is trying to encourage Chris to work out his marriage with Shanann? Because to me, it seems obvious that Nicole was very clearly jealous of Shanann's proximity to Chris. And that is even more evident in Nicole's own words about what transpired when Chris texted her shortly after he left to be with his family. I remember when he was in North Carolina and he was like trying to patch things up with his wife and he told me he loved me and I was like, don't say that to me. Like, (laughs) please go try to fit. And I mean, and that might even be in the text too, where it's like, don't, don't, like, don't say those words to me and then go try to make peace with your wife and lay in bed with another woman. Like, Do you know how we know that Nicole's whole narrative about encouraging Chris to fix his marriage is a lie? Because we have Chris and Shanann's text messages, and the entire time that Chris was in North Carolina, he wasn't patching anything up with Shanann. On the contrary, he did the exact opposite of that, telling her that he didn't want to have another child. And we can see through Shanann's text messages to her closest friends how devastated she was by Chris's actions and his behavior towards her and their children. We have no evidence whatsoever that Chris ever told Nicole anything about repairing his marriage with Shanann. But we do have evidence that Chris and Nicole were talking the entire time that she was supposedly encouraging him to fix his marriage. But let's just imagine that Nicole did text Chris, telling him to fix his relationship with Shanann. Then why is she sending him lewd images of herself multiple times a day, calling and texting him the entire time? Those two things cannot exist in the same space at the same time. It's called a contradiction. Which only leaves the obvious conclusion that Nicole Kessinger is very clearly lying to law enforcement. Again. But if you look at what she said from the vantage point of the envious mistress who is turning green from her own unbridled jealousy, then revisiting this statement makes perfect sense now. Like, I remember when he was in North Carolina and he was like trying to patch things up with his wife and he told me he loved me and I was like, don't say that to me. Like, (laughs) 
please go try to fit. And I mean, and that might even be in the text too, where it's like, don't, don't, like, don't say those words to me and then go try to make peace with your wife and lay in bed with another woman. Like, just don't do that. Because Chris was very clearly trying to maintain his relationship with Nicole while giving Shanann the cold shoulder, breaking her heart in the process. And despite Chris's efforts to keep the peace, Nicole was having none of it. Which is why she told him to not say that he loved her because she was furious that he was there and that Nicole wasn't his primary concern. It's why she continuously sent him pictures that she knew would keep his attention. It's why she kept calling him because she was unable to accept the fact that she wasn't number one in his life. And it's why Nicole would go on to tell Chris that she was even talking to two other men on eHarmony because she wanted him to feel jealous and possessive. And frankly, it worked. But all of this would only lead me to the next considerable problem with this first interview conducted by Agent Kovac. In the first 30 minutes of Nicole's interview, Agent Kovac explains that he would like Nicole's permission to obtain her cell phone records. She is very clearly uncomfortable with this request. But this is the moment when we are faced with our first monumentally obvious problem with how this entire interview was structured and the absurdity of what law enforcement was about to allow. I'm with you. We definitely need to accelerate the case because the more, law, the more it takes, the less sure that they are of situations. This statement by Dwayne Kessinger is one of the most disturbing and outright baffling comments that came from this initial interview. Because where in the world does Nicole's father get the gall to tell law enforcement that they need to accelerate the case? There's no mention or concern from him or Nicole about Shanann and the girls, let alone their family. And he has the audacity to tell law enforcement that they need to hurry this along? And that alone would have caused me to flip the emergency brake on this entire interview. Because over the years, I've sat with people who have outright lied to me or said something that I know will be extremely problematic for them in the future. And had he said that to me, I would have responded and said, you know, I I'm sorry, Mr. Kessinger, but you just said that the longer this takes, the less sure they are of situations. Less sure of what situations exactly? Because to me, it sounds like you're concerned that your daughter's story isn't going to stand up to any measure of scrutiny if this case goes to trial, which is something that Nicole herself says here. I don't really know what to do. I feel like if I talk to them, they're either going to try to like find some holes in my story or try to get me to like be Chris's only ally. And I don't really feel like dealing with either one of those. Holes in her story? What holes? Do you know what concerns me, Mr. Kessinger? How many times your daughter has already lied to the FBI and now, in this interview, all in a span of about 90 minutes? And it's evident to me, based on your concern for expediting this case alone, that you probably already know that her statements have the same structural integrity of a wet paper towel. So I'll ask it again. What situations are we going to be less sure of exactly? But here's the unfortunate reality of this entire back and forth with this 30-year-old woman's daddy and these veteran law enforcement officers. And that's the sad truth that this interaction was only going to get much worse. I think, I know why he lied to me. He lied to me because if I'd have known that he had a child on the way, I'd have never wasted my time with him in the first place. Like, none of this would ever even occur. Like you just said, if I knew he was his wife was pregnant, I wouldn't be in this picture. So if his wife was not pregnant, um, and forgive me, but if, if, if he takes her out of the picture, you, you're never going to know that she was pregnant, right? What do you mean takes her out of the picture? Like if, if he murdered her, she's out of the picture. You're never going to know if she was pregnant. If he can get away with murder, you're not going to... I got divorced from my wife. You say, do you understand what I'm saying here? If, if she's gone... But this... Don't lead. Hypothetically. Please. Yeah, don't hypothetically. Lead on. If she, okay. you understand where I'm going. If right, you didn't you're, know. You're leading into right. questions that are but nothing with your. If you didn't know, though. Wait, Nick. That she was there. Did you hear what I said? 
I'm not I'm following you. I just want her to answer a question that relates to. This is very easily one of the most alarming and problematic issues that came from this entire interview. Nicole Kessinger has just said that if she knew that Shanann was pregnant, that she would have never been involved with Chris in the first place. Now, we have reason to believe that she did know that Shanann was pregnant based on her Google searches alone. But right after she makes this stunning confession, for the first time in this entire interview, Agent Kobach does the right thing. He challenges Nicole because what she just said is quite literally the definition of providing Chris a motive. And the moment that he has Nicole on the ropes and is forcing her to explain herself, her father is not only allowed to completely stop law enforcement's rightful questioning, but he tells them to stop asking leading questions. Why these agents didn't stop the interview and escort him out the door at that moment is not just some procedural misstep, but is completely unacceptable. Law enforcement is legally allowed to lie to you. They are allowed to say whatever they want to say, absent of violating your constitutional rights, in order to protect and preserve their investigation. So Agent Kobach had no reason whatsoever to allow Dwayne Kessinger in that room, especially because he is not an attorney and had no knowledge about this case. And during one of their most important lines of questioning, he completely obstructed them and then railroaded the entire conversation. And because law enforcement is allowed to lie, Agent Kobach could have easily told Nicole that they needed to speak to her in private and made up some reason why her father was not allowed in that room. Speaking from experience, I have witnessed detectives do this very thing on countless occasions. Which is why this comment is even more disturbing when you realize how inappropriate it was for Dwayne Kessinger to even be in that room. It is... We want to give you everything, but we also want to be protected in doing so. It's more of the... Sure. Protected from what, Mr. Kessinger? If Nicole is a completely innocent witness that did not influence, encourage, or participate in the crimes that Chris Watts committed, then what could she possibly need to be protected from? Which leads me to my next point. Over the years, many people have asked the question... Who was Dwayne Kessinger, and why was he even allowed in the interview in the first place? In fact, many conspiracy theories have formed around this issue, but I have seen Dwayne Kessinger's resume, and there is no evidence that he was a member of law enforcement or a former detective. Over the years, claims have been made that he had a close personal relationship with key members of law enforcement. Unfortunately, absent of definitive evidence of that relationship, it's merely conjecture. But I cannot recall a single time in my entire career where a parent of an adult witness was allowed to come into an interview and then dominate some of the most important questions being asked by law enforcement. And law enforcement allowing that to happen wasn't just inappropriate. It was and is completely unacceptable. And it's why so many of us are still baffled by how this investigation was conducted. And I wish that these were the only issues that I had found, but you might be surprised to learn that I haven't even come close to telling you half of the problems, lies, misdirections, and overt falsehoods that I found in these interviews. And this next one helps to show you just how deceptive Nicole Kessinger was throughout the entirety of her interaction with law enforcement. So you, when, during your guys' dating time, did you guys spend most of the time at your place? Always. Okay, always at your place. Okay, so Nicole's just said that they always spent time at her place. And we have already heard her say previously that she went to the Lazy Dog with Chris on the 11th of August. And in her own words, she stated that it was one of the only times that she went out in public with Chris Watts. And did you guys, was there anything else? Uh, that you did just, was it just dinner? Did you go any place else to visit him? No, we just went to dinner. That's one of the only times I've actually ever been out in public with him. Now, I think we can all agree that these are not ambiguous statements. She's being very emphatic and clear about how she's answering these questions. But listen to what Nicole Kessinger tells Agent Kobach just five days later during her fourth interview. So, you, you, we talked about this um, 
prior and let's just revisit it. Um, you guys never really went out on a date per se with the exception of this Saturday night on the 11th. Usually you no, guys we went... spent time at your home um, versus going out, in, unless I'm mistaken on what you're saying. You are. I, okay. So we, um, most nights would hang out at my house, but we went out a few times. And I have dates for everything, and okay. I can give you that once yeah. I'm done with this. Um, so... Yep, you heard that right. Nicole just did a 180 on her entire story again. But this time, she adds a little gaslighting into Agent Kobach and tells him that he's the one that's mistaken. But for the record, he's not mistaken. Because as we just heard, she very adamantly answered these questions previously. But this is the same conversation where Nicole now remembers in striking detail the eight different times that she and Chris were out in public together. And for anyone keeping track, that's now the 11th time that she's lied and misled law enforcement. And we are only about two hours into her seven hours of recorded witness statements. But it's what I found in the pages of the discovery that helped me to gain a more clear understanding of the kind of person that Nicole Kessinger truly is. And why it is painfully obvious to me that there is so much more to this story. I'm going with that. I completely understand. And to be honest with you, I mean, there were several discussions that we had about his current relationship and where it had gone and what it had caused. Um, and he talked about his kids from time to time. But the thing was, is he was never hostile. It was never anything aggressive. Like even when he spoke of his wife and the fact that they were separating, it was never like ill. It was, it was very... It was still very kind. It was just like, this is not working. After spending over a month of studying Nicole's interviews, I've learned that any time she begins a statement with, to be honest with you, she's about to lie. As we just heard, it seems obvious that Nicole is trying to paint a positive image of Chris and Shanann's marriage. She's telling Agent Kobach that Chris never spoke poorly of Shanann, that he wasn't hostile or aggressive. And in the day prior, during her interview with the FBI, Nicole made an even more declarative statement to Agent Mark Lehrer. If she ever came up in conversation, he was very, like, civil about her. Like, he never had anything, like, negative or derogatory to say about her. He just told me, you know, we're separating, this is why, and that was about it. He never had anything negative or derogatory to say about Shanann. You are going to want to burn that statement into the back of your mind because I promise you that what you're about to hear is so antithetical to that statement that it might be hard to believe that Nicole Kessinger ever uttered those words at all. The only, like I said, the only financial thing he ever said is just like, she just likes to spend money, like a lot of it. So that was just kind of the vibe that I got from that. And that it was just, it was a lifestyle that she liked to live, like very like materialistic kind of lifestyle. Wanted to like project was, a certain image. Yes, all the time. And he said that that was why they got that house too. It's like she wants everybody to think that we live a certain way and that we can like sustain all this stuff. And he's like, and we can't. And I told him, I said, when you're in those situations, why don't you, I'm like, do you, do you like voice your concern about this? And he told me, he's like, when I try to talk to her, he's like, she's really bossy and she usually shuts me out. And he's like, when she does that, he's like, I just let it go. And I'm just like, all right. I mean, I don't, I don't try to like interfere with how those two interact. But I did ask about it because I'm just curious because I would never put myself in a situation where someone was like, you know what, we're going to live in this house that costs like double what we can afford and that's how it's going to be because I want everybody to think we're fancy because I wouldn't do that. I mean, to me, like I wouldn't put up with somebody doing that to me. You wouldn't put up with someone doing that to you? That's interesting because do you know what I've noticed, Nicole? You've only been speaking with law enforcement for all of about two hours and already the statement you just made sounds eerily close to what law enforcement calls a motive. Because if you have no problem whatsoever making such distasteful and heartless comments just three days after what happened to Shanann and her children, it doesn't seem like much of a stretch that you could have said the same exact thing to Chris. 
Because what you just said sure sounds to me like you were applying pressure to Chris to confront Shanann and to highlight the financial issues that were already boiling over in their marriage. Issues, by the way, that were none of your business. And do you know what else is extremely disconcerting to me, Nicole? When in this same interview, you said this. So another thing, so that was Tuesday and that was it for Tuesday, but I forgot some stuff on Monday that I did need to bring up to you guys. So Monday, um, when we were on the phone at one point, he mentioned to me, I can't even believe I have to say this. She left her wedding ring here and I said something along the lines of, does that mean you two are done? And he was like, He said, how much do you think it's worth? And I was like, remember hearing him say that and being like, what the fuck? And I remember thinking to myself, like, I don't even know how to respond to this. And so I was like, I don't know, pawn it, man. I have to hand it to you, Nicole. Your ability to gaslight and to deflect suspicion should be taught as a masterclass in supervillain school. Because nothing about what you just said makes any sense whatsoever. Because just one minute ago, you said this. Um, but I mean, I was. I was like kind of scared. I was, what I was really scared for was scared for his family's well-being because it's like, I don't know where these people are at this point. And it's scary. I mean, it's scary that she's gone, but it's even more scary to me that these little girls are gone. Like that was the part that really freaked me out. Like if it was just her, I'd be like, well, maybe she took off with somebody. Maybe she didn't. I mean, I don't know because she's a grown woman and she can make those choices. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever, Nicole. You just said that you were scared, fearful, panicked, and deeply worried concerning the whereabouts of Shanann and the girls. And this was on Monday, the day that they were initially reported missing. And on that same day, while you were worried and terrified and telling Chris to calm you down, you tell him to pawn his wife's wedding ring? In what universe does that make any sense whatsoever? Because it isn't this one. In the expanse of just this one interview, you claim that you thought that she would be home the next day, and then minutes later claim that you were worried and panicked about her disappearance. So if you thought she was coming home and you were concerned about her disappearance, then why would you tell Chris to pawn the ring? Pretend I'm in kindergarten and you have to make it make sense to me. Go ahead. I'll wait. But do you know what would make a lot more sense and explain all of these inconsistencies? Now, this is just how I see it, maybe because it's completely obvious, but it would make a lot more sense to me that you were panicked and freaking out because you knew that law enforcement was already involved in the crime that Chris had committed. And it's why you searched Google for this. Because you knew you had something to hide. Because all of your panic and fear makes a lot more sense when you remember that all of this happened on the same day that you told Chris to text you proof of him being at Survey 319. You remember where his whole family was found? And your detailed, nonsense explanation to Agent Kobach about the ring starts to make sense because you clearly realized how bad it was going to look that on the same day that his pregnant wife and children go missing, you were telling Chris to just pawn her ring. Because here's the thing, Nicole, when you turn in your typewritten report on September 4th, your story goes from having told law enforcement that Chris never had an unkind word to say about Shanann to all of a sudden remembering all of this hateful, despicable vitriol that Chris said against his wife. And your detailed and descriptive revelations all just happen to be on the heels of you being asked if maybe you were the reason why he committed the crimes. And I couldn't help but notice that all of these statements that you claim you've had with Chris were never once brought up in any of your previous interviews despite having been asked by law enforcement on five different occasions if you knew anything further about his relationship with Shanann. Because once again, your memory works in reverse. Now you can recall story after story that paints Shanann in the worst imaginable light. And the only reason I'm even showing them now is to prove that you said them. But for me, it's what Nicole says next that only serves to prove my point even more. What's the catalyst for this event? Do you have any, have you had, and I, 
I know it's a hard question, but I want to get it out now. We're here. If, if there's a thought that you have um, that might lead us to understand a little bit why he might have done something like this. Um, you know, I've thought about this, and sometimes I think to myself, if I wasn't in that man's life, would his family still be alive? And I've thought about this a lot, and I think I could give myself different responses. But in all honesty, I think they might be alive, but not permanently. I do not think that this man just snapped. I don't think that he just met some amazing woman and he was just going to try to murder his family and then think that I was okay with, like, building a relationship with somebody who did something like that. And so, for me, like, when I think of what was he going through his head, I find it really hard to believe that I am the catalyst for all of this. But I don't think people just snap. Love does not murder. Hate and resentment murder. That's the way I look at that. But this is just my like opinion, but I'm pretty convinced that that woman and him did not get along very well. When I first started to analyze this case, I came into it having been told multiple times over by a number of people that Nicole Kessinger was unfairly treated by conspiracy theorists all over the internet. The truth is, no one is perfect. And there are moments in all of our lives where I think we can all agree that if we could do it over again, we would make different decisions. But I've listened to all of Nicole's statements multiple times over. Statements she made throughout this entire investigation. And she never once takes any responsibility for her proximity to this crime. In fact, she is so preoccupied with placing the blame on Chris and his marriage that even the insinuation that she could have been the catalyst is rejected, refused, and denied. But the reason this case still persists in the hearts and minds of millions all around the world isn't because we refuse to move on. On the contrary, it's because we can see the mistakes fixable mistakes concerning the lack of attention to detail that surround Nicole Kessinger's involvement throughout this entire investigation. And it's those mistakes that have become impossible to ignore. The inner workings of a homicide investigation are a series of tasks and responsibilities that require a considerable amount of time, effort, and manpower. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of working with some of the finest men and women within law enforcement, and those interactions have taught me to respect and appreciate their service to our communities. And I will always value the efforts of law enforcement to solve the cases that are thrust upon them during one of the worst moments of someone's entire life. In prior video series, I have discussed Jody Arias, Scott Peterson, and Chandler Halderson, and in my analysis of those cases, I have praised the efforts of law enforcement and district attorneys who are able to affect the right outcome in their dogged pursuit of justice. But the men and women of law enforcement are ultimately accountable to the people that they serve, to each of us, because ultimately it is our votes and our tax money that empowers them to do their jobs. And above all else, their job is to ensure that justice is served. However, law enforcement's pursuit of justice does not begin and end with maintaining a high conviction rate. And I know that I'm not alone when I say that justice is incomplete if someone involved in a crime has successfully evaded being held accountable for their actions. And I believe that in the matter of Nicole Kessinger, key members of law enforcement failed in their duty to thoroughly investigate the clear signs that she misled and lied to them throughout the entirety of their investigation. And I want to show you exactly what I mean when I say that. I was recently contacted by a former homicide detective who is a subscriber of this channel. He reached out to me because he wanted to provide his insights concerning Nicole Kessinger, and due to his ongoing work in other areas of law enforcement, I have agreed to maintain his anonymity. In our conversation, he explained that one of the first steps that homicide detectives make during an investigation is to verify any and all claims made by key witnesses, especially their alibis. 
He went on to explain that a key witness on the caliber of Nicole Kessinger would have had her alibi confirmed with or without her permission or even her involvement. Which is why this interaction between Nicole and Agent Kobach is so incredibly disturbing. Or yeah. getting home. Did like, you give Mark Jim's information? No, I would really like not like to involve him in this. Okay. He does not know about this. He didn't. He was not like he doesn't know any of this is occurring. Okay. Like I was. So he kinda, he knows certainly through the media. That something's occurred. Yeah, he's with like Chris. Out of town. He's probably has okay. no idea. He doesn't okay. know who Chris is. Like he's not. I do not know. So he's just a friend of yours. Yes. Um, he does that not was to coming to your this. apartment and doesn't know anything about Chris. Does he know anything about no. Chris? No. Okay. What I'm talking about is your movement. Oh. Um, by GPS or by cell phone tower to show where you were. Obviously. And I don't want to cause you concern. We want to know where you were that day, too. Agent Kobach has just told Nicole that he needs to verify her whereabouts on August the 13th due to her proximity and intimate relationship with Chris Watts. She explains that on that day, she got off work around 3 p.m. and went straight home and was then greeted by her close friend, Jim. Logically, Agent Kobach tells her that he would like to verify her alibi with Jim directly. But despite Nicole's initial refusal, Agent Kobach again explains his need to verify her alibi. And Nicole's response is to simply implode. Um, I'm well, a pretty boring person. Well, it sounds like you just places. went to work that day and then you came home and you were there at 345. Yeah, like give or day. take like five yeah, minutes. Whatever. But yeah, so 345, I meet Jim there. Yeah, I was And so that. Jim is a... Understand from an investigative point, he could be a person who could say, "Yeah, I was there at 3:45. I don't. He doesn't know Chris. He doesn't know anything. He could say with one phone call, "Yeah, she came in at 3:45. Done. Totally. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I don't have to ask anything more than, "Hi, Chris. My name's Kevin. I'm, I'm uh, or, or uh, Jim. And I'm not saying Jim you have to give it to you. Just leave Jim alone. If, if at some point, up in this. If at one of the more important things I have learned from my interactions with law enforcement over the years is a phrase that I would routinely hear them say, trust but verify. I have learned that maintaining a positive and respectful interaction with a witness is important, but that importance is drastically overshadowed by the need for verifiable truth. That the need for justice outweighs the importance of potentially offending or upsetting a witness that has not been ruled out as a suspect in that crime. But in this interview, no matter how many times Agent Kobach initially appeared to make the right call, he would almost always follow it up with the wrong one. And I don't want to cause you concern. We want to know where you were that day, too. You're dating a man who did some egregious stuff, and we want to, put, we want to show that you were never near him that day, period. Agent Kobach has just met Nicole Kessinger for the first time. It has only been three days since this crime. And at this moment in time, he has no evidence that can definitively rule out Nicole's involvement. And if he had read the FBI's report from the day before, then he would already have been aware of the fact that Nicole has already lied to him more than half a dozen times within the first 90 minutes of this interview. Why would he want to show that Nicole wasn't near Chris if he had no evidence that could prove that she wasn't involved? Because now he has specifically told her exactly what he wants and she categorically refuses to give it to him. But what I simply cannot understand is why he relents. Because once again, we have no evidence that law enforcement ever contacted or spoke with Nicole's elusive friend, Jim. But as I went through law enforcement's discovery, I began to notice a pattern that gave way to the possible legal ramifications of Nicole Kessinger's behavior during these interviews. And at the very least, these legal issues are important to understand because of the impact they can still have present day. One of the primary arguments that I repeatedly hear regarding Nicole Kessinger is that none of the information that we have discussed is indisputable evidence of her involvement in this crime. But what's so amusing to me about that claim is how effective it is at proving my point. 
Because if there was this much compelling evidence that Nicole Kessinger lied to law enforcement, then they had no excuse in failing to fully investigate her possible involvement. The lack of evidence is not proof of innocence, but in this case, it is proof of incompetence. Because the claim that she was cleared by law enforcement is completely contradicted by law enforcement's own records. Records that, as you can plainly see, say that they are missing vital information just seven days before their investigation was closed. And to this very day, we see no evidence that law enforcement received or requested any new information during that period of time. Over the years, many people have focused on trying to obtain clear and undeniable proof that demonstrates Nicole's participation in Chris's crimes. From grainy video from the neighbor's security footage to Chris's truck GPS and weight sensors, there is a litany of rabbit holes that have preoccupied many still living on Watts Island. Unfortunately, law enforcement has completely and totally ignored all of it. But absent of a literal smoking gun, I have focused my attention onto something that I believe is more tangible and far easier to achieve. Something that most people, including law enforcement, have completely overlooked. The legal definition of obstruction of justice is when a person intentionally obstructs, impairs, or hinders the performance of a governmental function by a public servant. Obstruction of justice also includes interference in an investigation, falsifying, hiding, or destroying evidence, and lying while participating in that investigation, lying to law enforcement during questioning, or giving a false statement. So as we can plainly see, destroying evidence, obstructing or hampering an investigation while giving false statements according to Colorado law is a crime. So with that in mind, let's revisit this moment in the Chris Watts investigation. She originally came forward and, and spoke to investigators on her own volition. Prior to the time, unfortunately, that she came in and spoke with investigators, she had deleted all of the information off of her phone that had any connection between her and Chris Watts. That hampered the investigation. Um, that hampered our ability to get that electronic digital um, connection between the two. She was interviewed on multiple occasions. I believe that for the most part, she was forthcoming in the course of those investigations. For the most part, she was forthcoming. To me, that sounds like legal speak for the DA acknowledging that he is well aware of the fact that Nicole did not tell the truth at various points of their investigation. But just to reiterate, did you hear what he said? She hampered their investigation. By the way, hampered is a synonym for obstructed. But just as we heard, the Weld County District Attorney has just said that Nicole Kessinger hampered their investigation by deleting vital evidence and that she was not always truthful in her statements. So if she was not always truthful, then we can extrapolate that to mean that even the Weld County District Attorney admits that Nicole Kessinger lied. We have the DA on record saying that she obstructed their investigation, she deleted evidence, and she lied, and people wonder why there is still ongoing interest in this case. Now, I want to acknowledge that while district attorneys do have broad discretion for when or how they charge for any given offense, which, in my opinion, kind of defeats the whole purpose of having laws and a justice system, if someone can just arbitrarily pick and choose when to enforce those laws, but I digress... But the issue of obstruction of justice is not a small and inconsequential charge. Now, I want to be very clear. I am not about to make a political statement, but rather a legal one. Because regardless of where you stand politically speaking, obstruction of justice is one of the charges that former President Trump is facing right now. So if our justice system can charge a former president with obstruction of justice, then I'm pretty sure that Nicole Kessinger isn't exempt from that accountability either. Because in the event that a DA prosecuted Nicole with obstructing their investigation for any of the previously listed reasons, 
she could face charges for each and every occurrence of that offense, which would mean a charge for every single lie. And when you realize that obstruction of justice can carry up to six months in jail per offense, you can see how lying to law enforcement easily dozens of times could become extremely problematic for Nicole Kessinger. Especially when you see the number of times throughout this investigation where Nicole was very clearly worried that law enforcement was going to do exactly that. In Nicole Kessinger's final face-to-face -face interview with Agent Kobach, she reiterated her ongoing concern that she had expressed on multiple prior occasions. Nicole was extremely worried and was trying to ascertain whether or not law enforcement was going to pursue her for criminal charges relating to a crime that even she believed that she could be charged with. Listen closely. Are you guys... Am I in trouble because I related to sex? You're not in trouble. I didn't know what was going on at no. that point. So, <laughs> I know it's... Is there a, does that cause question? Of course it Of course it does. It does. Uh, there is, but is it criminal? No. From the very first interview that Agent Kobach ever had with Nicole Kessinger, he made excuses for her. He has hand-fed her the responses that law enforcement needed to hear in order to rule her out of their investigation. And even when she admitted to deleting everything off of her phone and telling Chris to do the same, he never once called her out on any of her lies or the obvious signs that she was hiding something from law enforcement. And as we have just learned, deletion of evidence can be a chargeable offense in any criminal investigation. So how CBI agent Kobach, who is not a district attorney, is able to say with his whole chest that Nicole's actions are not criminal is both baffling and completely inappropriate in my view. Because when I listened to Nicole's statements in every interview from beginning to end, what I observed was not someone trying to assist police with their investigation by providing important information to aid the victims in their pursuit of justice, but something else entirely. So that, that may be something that we could use help on. You guys you? Can keep my name out of the newspapers for the while, would be nice. It's important to remember that at this moment in time, just two days after this crime took place, using Nicole's version of events, she is well aware that Shanann and the girls are missing. But 33 minutes into her first interview, she's more concerned about keeping her name out of the papers than she is the literal victims of this case. And Nicole always has a way of telling everyone exactly what she's really worried about just through the questions that she asks. During her third interview, she said, is this going to be one of those things where if it goes to trial, they'll like hold me accountable for every single little itty bitty word? Held accountable? That's a really strange way of describing giving witness testimony, Nicole. Held accountable for what exactly? Because to me, it sounds like you're worried that a good defense lawyer is going to do exactly what I've been doing and pick apart your entire narrative. Because the whole thing is Swiss cheese, Nicole. It's full of holes. But easily, one of the most damning pieces of information that I came across while reviewing the discovery evidence was found at the very end of Detective Pearl's report. And while this may not be the literal smoking gun at a jury trial, it showed me something far more important that speaks to Nicole Kessinger's character. Because just six days after Chris committed his crimes, Nicole Kessinger opened up Google, went past a myriad of news reports covering the horrific story that she was directly connected to. She then clicked on the search bar and began typing. And when she pressed enter, Google returned a search result for exactly how much money Amber Fry made on her book deal, including Amber Fry's net worth and whether or not people hated Amber Fry. But on behalf of the millions of people all around the world who have seen through your ruse, Nicole, allow me to answer that question for you. The answer is no. The general public doesn't hate Amber Fry. We never did. And do you know why? Because she didn't lie to law enforcement from the moment she opened her mouth. 
In fact, she didn't wait to contact them for two entire days to inform them of her unfortunate connection to Scott Peterson. Oh, and for the record, you and Amber Fry have absolutely nothing in common because she didn't delete all of her text messages and then tell Scott to do the exact same thing. Amber did, however, show heartfelt empathy and concern for Lacey and the Rocha family and then went out of her way to continually cooperate with law enforcement at every imaginable turn. I am very sorry for Lacey's family and the, co- the pain that this has caused them. And I pray for her safe return as well. Because she understood, even back then, that her proximity to the Peterson case was vital to securing his conviction, and she wanted to do the right thing and tell the truth from the moment she became aware of Scott Peterson's ruse. And the difference between you and Amber Fry is that she actually had integrity, and the world will remember her courage and the character that she exhibited during the truly tragic loss of Lacey and Connor Peterson. But the same cannot be said of you, and no amount of time will ever change our unified plea for law enforcement to reopen an investigation into whatever it is that you are still hiding. But until that day comes, just know that we will wait patiently. And know this, Nicole, we will not forget. When the trio of agents visited Chris Watson prison in February of 2019, their primary objective was to get answers to the questions that they had not been able to ask Chris after his confession. One of the first things that stood out to me in my analysis of this interview was a question that agent Tammy Lee asked Chris concerning the matter of Trent Bolt. Trent was a man who claimed to have been in a lengthy adult relationship with Chris Watts in the year preceding his crimes. Law enforcement never seriously considered that Bolt was telling the truth, but it's Agent Lee's question that I found to be outright perplexing. The Amanda girl, the, the Trent guy, to the, uh, from like people going on Inside Edition saying they knew me or went out with me or had like whatever else with me, and it's like I don't I don't want them to think that it's like other like false information going out there because like people are getting hold of information like where did they get this information from I do. Would you like to see those people charged? But you would not want to be listed as a victim in that case, as far as him being charged with like false reporting. By the time this conversation happens, it has been almost six months since law enforcement initially met with Trent Bolt. And in their interview with him, they were so convinced that he was lying that they were even willing to charge him for having submitted a false report. In fact, during their conversation with Bolt, they made it very clear that his inconsistencies were vast, and they were having none of it. So, Trent, can we have kind of a tough conversation? Sure. Some of the stuff you're talking about is pretty hard to believe. And we're getting to the point where we're wondering if you're wasting our time. Uh You told us that you watched the video over and over. Okay, so we know that you're aware of everything that's out there. And all you've talked about are things that anyone else knows. You haven't brought forth any information. You're having sex with a guy in his car, and you don't know anything about him other than what the public knows about him. Okay? You took $60 from him. You you were self-admitted booty call. I don't know what's going on with you, but I don't know why you're here tonight. And now you can't find his phone number. Well, I had cut every... Stop. Just stop. Do you see how that kind of doesn't make sense, Trent? No. So let me back up, because you can tell I'm getting a little bit angry, right? So before I get angry, how about we start over and I'll say this. I just can't figure out why you're doing all this, why you're lying to us. So let's recap. Law enforcement agents meet with Trent Bolt, listen to his story, notices that he is unable to provide any details that haven't already been released to the public, and they see right through his obvious attempts to lie. Now, I'm going to ask you to indulge me for a moment because I want to reiterate this one one more time for the people in the back. Law enforcement agents connected to the Chris Watts investigation have just asked him if he is willing to proceed with charges against Trent Bolt and anyone else for lying about their connection to him. 
they are quite literally prepared to charge someone with a crime for having lied to law enforcement. And yet, despite the fact that Nicole Kessinger has also lied on a multitude of occasions, far more brazen and obvious lies, I might add, we are told that there is no reason whatsoever to investigate Nicole Kessinger at this time. And it would be one thing if someone, anyone, had sat Nicole down at some point of this investigation and confronted her over her inconsistent statements, the same way they did with every other witness. And if there was any evidence that someone in law enforcement had thoroughly vetted Nicole, then maybe people wouldn't still be talking about her five years later. But according to law enforcement's own discovery records, that never happened. But I do have an important question. If law enforcement was already certain that Nicole Kessinger wasn't involved in any way and they have supposedly cleared her, then why did they ask Chris this question three entire months after this case was already closed. There are quite a few people who would tell us, and who do tell us, you need to look into Nikki more, Nikki Kissinger. All the way from the extreme end of things being, Nikki's the one who ordered the hit. She was there, hiding in the basement. She was she there. Was, yeah. you know, so the, the extreme is, she's the one who told Chris to do it. She's the real problem. All the way, that's the extreme side, and then all the way to... Well, there were these texts where she was infatuated, she was in love, she was saying how good Chris was in the sack, and maybe we should look at her more. In the years following this interview, Chris Watts would communicate with Sherilyn Cato in connection to her book, Letters from Christopher. In the book, Chris explains how upset he was over this unannounced and surprise interaction with law enforcement. To be clear, I have nothing good to say in defense of Chris Watts. But I am baffled how this entire investigation was conducted. He is already in prison, and these are the people who facilitated putting him there. They don't bother to tell him that they're coming, and Chris even says that he felt ambushed by them, which will only eliminate the possibility of him ever wanting to speak with them again. And then they proceed to ask him questions that they should have asked him on the 15th of August the year prior, when he was still sitting in this seat just after having failed the lie detector test. You know, questions like this. What, did she know that Shanann was pregnant with a boy? No. Did she know Shanann was pregnant? No. And why is that? You just didn't tell her? I didn't know. Like, because we had met. But Shanann put that on Facebook. That's, that's, like, that's how did she I, not see that? I don't know. Throughout this entire interview, there are clear signs of Chris Watts repeating the same lies that Nicole told law enforcement months prior. But I do want to say this. Agent Tammy Lee was asking Chris the right questions. In fact, she should have been the person assigned to Nicole Kessinger from day one. Agent Lee should have been responsible for asking all of the questions that Agent Kobach dropped the ball on. And I don't blame Agent Tammy Lee or Agent Graham Coder or Detective Baumhover. They were the only people attempting to get to the truth. I do, however, blame their superiors and Agent Kobach for the clear failures that happened at so many critical moments of this investigation. But there was something that I found incredibly odd about law enforcement's surprise visit with Chris Watts that February. At first, I couldn't put my finger on it, but then I realized what it was. There was someone missing from this interview, and I had to find out why. On September 4th, 2018, Nicole Kessinger arrived at the Frederick Police Department, where she met with Detective Baumhover and Agent Kobach. In the discovery, there is a note of this interaction that on its face seems fairly innocuous. But after years of reading discovery provided by law enforcement throughout my career, I have learned how to interpret their notations and what specifically to look for in piecing together their narrative. Because I couldn't help but notice this statement by Agent Kobach. Quote, From August 16, 2018, my communication with Kessinger, with the exception of recorded interviews, was completed by text message. Unquote. The reason this note stood out to me is because these are the text messages that he was referring to in his notation between him and Nicole. Their conversation in these messages is very odd to me because throughout every single page of nearly 2,000 pages of discovery, you'll notice that every single time a member of law enforcement communicates with anyone from this investigation, 
Whether it's a witness, suspect, neighbor, or even an internet troll who wants their 15 minutes, that member of law enforcement will write a supplemental report of that interaction on that same day or soon thereafter. But the very first time that Agent Kovac ever mentions that he's been texting Nicole for several weeks is on the same day that he is removed from the responsibility of communicating with her. And when you see messages like this, it demonstrates why so many of us are baffled at how law enforcement can say with a straight face that our concerns about Nicole Kessinger are nothing more than a witch hunt. It's important to remember that Agent Kevin Kovac met and spoke with Nicole Kessinger on half a dozen different occasions. He spent over seven hours speaking to her face-to-face, -face, not including the hours of telephonic interviews and weeks of back-and-forth text messages that included conversations that I would describe as being less than professional. And when those three agents went to Dodge Correctional in February of 2019 to visit Chris Watts, Agent Kobach wasn't with them. Someone who had spent all that time as the primary point of contact for Nicole, a law enforcement agent who likely knew more about her than any of the three of them combined. And yet despite all of this, he is not only pulled from the investigation, but he has never heard from again. And this entire issue is exactly why disclosure, accountability, and thoroughly completing an investigation is so critically important to the process and completion of justice in any criminal action. What we want more than anything else is the truth, because the truth is the foundation of justice, and without it, justice remains incomplete. Because we can plainly see that there are people within this investigation that are saying in their own reports that the person who committed this crime and his mistress have successfully hidden vital evidence, evidence that was never retrieved, requested, or recovered. And I know that I am not alone when I say that I believe that Shanann, Bella, Cece, and Nico still deserve justice, even if it's difficult and inconvenient. Because it's never too late to do the right thing, when all we are asking for is the truth and justice. In September of 2019, a new true crime podcast was released that discussed the homicide of a young woman who had been a student at Cal Poly in the 1990s. Her disappearance made national news, but despite law enforcement's efforts, the case would go unsolved and would eventually be relegated to the cold case unit at the San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Department. This previously unknown podcaster named Chris Lambert had no prior experience in law enforcement he had no previous work history in the law and had no formal or informal training on how to conduct a criminal investigation. But Chris Lambert was relentless. He dug into the evidence and found details that law enforcement had seemingly overlooked. And in a matter of just a few months, his podcast would be downloaded 12 million times. Because of public pressure and renewed interest in the case, law enforcement would utilize information obtained from Lambert and would eventually find compelling evidence that would lead to the arrest of the longtime suspect, Paul Flores, a man that would go on to be convicted for the disappearance and homicide of Kristen Smart. Over the years, the Chris Watts case has become a heartbreaking example of how important it is for law enforcement to pursue justice and not just a conviction. And in the matter of Chris Watts, it is evident through law enforcement's own words that they were unable to complete their own investigation. And that is exactly why those three agents went back to Chris months later, because they knew they didn't have the whole picture. And frankly, they still don't. Whoa, wait, like we're not done. We have all these things to do. We didn't examine all the evidence. We didn't interview every witness we needed to. We didn't do all of these things that you would do in a normal investigation because he stopped the clock. We were relieved that it was gonna be over, but at the same time, we felt like, in a sense, we didn't finish. In the late 1990s, after Kristen Smart's initial disappearance, law enforcement had become well aware of Paul Flores and his possible involvement in the crime. 
At the time, Sheriff Ed Williams spoke with a local San Luis Obispo newspaper and told them that they needed the primary suspect, Paul Flores, to tell law enforcement what happened to Kristen Smart. And absent of his confession, they didn't see any possibility of solving the case. But despite decades of law enforcement's obstinate posture, the community chose to rally behind Chris Lambert's podcast. And with the groundswell of attention, he was able to play a vital role in helping to bring Paul Flores to justice. And I believe that we too can play a similar role in this case. But it's important that each of us understands the reality of the criminal justice system present day. After spending thousands of hours researching cases from all across the United States, some of the most impactful that I have studied are those where people have been wrongfully convicted. It has taught me the high price of justice that is paid in the years and decades that are stolen from people when that justice is rushed, when it isn't thorough, and when it doesn't allow for the full truth to come to light. And I know that I am not alone when I say that the reason this case has affected so many people like me is because Shanann, Bella, Cece, and Nico did not deserve this. And all we want is the truth. We want transparency, accountability. We want justice. And nothing about those values is a witch hunt. After decades of working with clients, it permanently ingrained in me the critical importance of empathy. Working with people who have endured painful experiences taught me to be a more compassionate person who understands that life is so much more than the end result, or simply handing a client a settlement check, or even convincing them that a conviction is where justice begins and ends. But empathy isn't real until it's cost you something. And sometimes the price will be inconvenient, but advocating for the truth for the victims, this is the way. Because it's the bylines and what's written between the ledgers that makes up the essence of justice. It's what was lost that truly matters, not maintaining a high conviction rate. It's not being able to make new memories with them anymore. It's Shanann playing with Cece and Bella while she gets them ready for school. It's the words of a mother and a wife who was doing everything in her power to save her marriage. It was their future. It was the graduations, the memories, and all that could have been. And it's the memories that will live on despite all of the pain that came with it. And that's why this case matters so much to me and to so many others of you because we cannot forget what was stolen. It may not have been our sister, our daughter, or our friend, but that is what empathy truly is, when you can feel the suffering of someone else and care enough to want to do whatever you can to make it right. And I believe that's why people like Chris Lambert chose to fight for the truth, to go against what he was told was possible and to use his talents to help point law enforcement in the right direction. I can't guarantee that the same day of reckoning will come soon, but I can guarantee that so many of us will not give up because the truth, it still matters. And I truly believe that justice is still within reach. No matter how hard life gets, no matter how low you feel, know that deep down in your heart, there's a purpose, a reason for everything. We may not understand it at the time, but eventually it will all make sense. It's hard to believe that it's been five years since all of this transpired, but no amount of time will ever change the impact that this case had on so many of our lives. Which is why I want to thank you for being here, because I truly believe that while we cannot change the past, we can advocate for justice, both now and in the future. 
So thank you in advance for helping continue to support my effort to raise awareness about these issues, because this is not a witch hunt. It's advocacy for the truth. One of the most effective tools that we have right now is showing people what actually happened throughout the discovery records. So just by watching this whole video to the end and then sharing, liking, commenting, and subscribing, those things go such a long way to help push this content out to even more people. People who will then have the opportunity to learn about these issues for themselves. So thank you all in advance for your support of this channel. Over the last six weeks, I have spent several hundred hours poring over this case, realizing after I had finished writing this episode that like most cases that I've covered on this channel, I would not be able to fit everything into only two episodes. Which is why I will be making a final video in this series, which will get posted in the next few weeks. And I assure you, the final video in this trilogy will be worth the wait. In fact, if you watch this video all the way to the end, I am leaving a teaser for the final episode. Now I want to take a moment to thank our Patreon and YouTube supporters who are the literal backbone of this channel. Most people are not aware of the fact that due to YouTube's guidelines, most if not all content created within the true crime genre is either demonetized or heavily restricted. And it's because of these issues that creators like myself are usually relegated to pursuing support through subscription-based programs, which then allow us to grow on this platform. So our Patreon and YouTube supporters are quite literally the reason that I am able to consistently create this content. And I am truly and eternally grateful for each and every one of you. Your support has opened the door to so many amazing opportunities that I never thought was possible. So please know that every single one of you are valued and appreciated endlessly. I want to take a moment to thank today's producers, Hazel C, Florentino M, Liz May, George L, and Mr. Merman Prince. I swear I'm never going to get tired of saying that name. <laughs> Also, concerning upcoming content on the channel, I will be releasing the Andrea Yates series next, including new series on Chandler Halderson, the Idaho Four, and the Gabby Petito series over the next several weeks. And rest assured, I will also be releasing the final episode in the Nicole Kessinger series very soon as well. So don't forget to subscribe to get notified for all of the new content coming to the channel coming over the next several weeks. Also, don't forget to check our community post with details for our subscriber giveaway with over a dozen winners being chosen in the first part of September. Finally, I want to end this video with a note of gratitude. Over the last several weeks, we have welcomed so many new subscribers to our community. All of you have shown such an incredible outpouring of support and your vote of confidence has absolutely humbled me in a way that I have never experienced before. Your kind, genuine, and truly thoughtful responses prove to me that we can create a positive and uplifting community right here on YouTube. And that's why I am truly looking forward to paying back that kindness in our upcoming subscriber giveaway. So stay tuned because there is new and exciting content coming to the channel, and I truly cannot wait to share it with each of you. And as always, this has been Behind Criminal Minds. We'll see you next time. I was um, in prison with uh, Chris um, twice at Dodge, and um, over the time that I spent with him, he uh, confided in me, and he said that um, his mistress was still in contact with him, and that um, she was involved in the murders of his um, family, and that she was never investigated, and he was trying to protect her. How was, how was she in contact with him? Letters or phone? Uh, letters. Letters? Yeah. They were in um, constant communication. Okay.
Can you say what she, what her involvement was? Do I, um, she killed uh, um, girls and he killed a man. Oh, and, uh, she did all three of them. No, he killed his wife and she killed his um, daughters because they felt that um, since CC and Celeste or Bella and CC was uh, Chris's kids, that he would have a harder time to kill them. So that's why she was the one that killed the little girls and he killed a man. How did you say how she killed him? Yeah, she uh, smothered them and he um, strangled Shanann. How long ago was this when he told you this? I'm sorry? How long ago was this when he told you this? Uh, well, I just got out in February and I got to uh, Dodge this last time in September. And it was that time that he told me that he was in contact with her and um, told me the roles that um, she played. 